Thanks for tuning into my channel and today I'm going to talk you through how to build a tiny home on wheels. I took this car hauler and turned it into a six person sleeping tiny home with all of the modern finishes. And this is part one of the construction. I'm going to have a four part series, so make sure you like and subscribe and I will walk you through every single detail. That I bought is a car hauler and it's 16 feet long, but with the overhang at the end, I'm going to gain an extra 30 inches if I build on it, which I intend to do. So the entire trailer will be over 18 and a half feet long. That is plenty of space for a weekend getaway had this vision of building something tiny. Everything I was finding online was really cool to watch, but it was nothing that met the needs of a family that doesn't want to dump $100,000 into a home on wheels. This is something that you can build start to finish in your driveway, and you can even make it smaller than this. Essentially, it's just like a camper that you can haul to the campsite and then haul home, and the investment is roughly about the same. If you're into not dumping every penny you have into a build like this, or if you just want to get inspired and see what's out there to build, follow along. We started by taking off the front rails, which were only just bolted on, and then we grinded off the tie downs. I will reattach the tie downs once the home is built because I'm in Nova Scotia, it gets pretty windy here, and I want to make sure wherever I park it, I have the option to tie it off. I called my brother to come out and help me. He has a lot more experience in framing homes than I do. The hardest part about framing this tiny home is that we didn't have it completely level. We shimmed it up and had it as level as possible, but it's kind of hard when you're building it on a trailer, which is on an uneven driveway on rocks. So there's nothing to really go off of, except that we needed to make sure that it was as square as possible, which means that your corners inside your home are perfectly 90 degrees. You start by marking a chalk line for your first wall. Measure from the outside inwards three and a half inches because that's the true width of a two by four and that line will be the inside of your first wall. The way that this trailer is built, and it might not be all of them, it has a metal lip on the bed so that the framing of our wall will be half on that and half on the pressure treated decking. The metal lip is about one quarter inches higher than the pressure treated decking. So we're going to use construction grade adhesive and shims to level out the two by four. The end of this trailer has a tilt to it. After all, it is a car hauler. I chose a car hauler though because I knew that this would be a heavy build and I trusted the weight capacity. This is where you would put the ramps for the car to get on top of it. So we're just gonna have to build up the base plate in this area and then level out the floor inside so that we can use that extra 18 inches of space. Framing a tiny home is exactly like framing any other building. We're going to be building the walls on the ground and squaring them up and then standing them in place. Your studs are going to be 16 inches on center. My brother is marking out the walls and laying them out on the ground and I am cutting the two by fours to 95 and a half inches to account for the top and bottom plates. I really would have liked to have built it a bit taller. Your tiny home can be whatever height you want it to be. But the reason I didn't was because I wasn't sure if I was going to be parking the tiny home somewhere permanent or if I was going to be hauling it around like I originally planned. Just like framing anything, again, the studs are 16 inches on center and we framed a doorway about 48 inches from one side. You'll see why I've done this later on in the video, but again, we don't have any plans to go off of just what I've drawn out on graph paper, so I've just went on a whim and chosen where to put the door. I didn't want the door in the middle, but I didn't want it completely on one side. Anyway, you'll see later on why it's here, but you can... Where, well, it doesn't matter. Put your door wherever you want to put your door. After all, it is your tiny home and I'm just showing you uh, my experience and how I brought mine to life. So you do you and design away. Once the frame was built, we added the plywood and we just added the bottom row because we framed the entire 16 foot wall, making sure that the walls were fully square before we stood them up. The reason you put your plywood on on the ground is so that your entire wall piece stays square. Remember, that means 90 degrees in the corners. You could frame the wall in place, but it wouldn't be as accurate. It wouldn't be nearly as accurate, actually. You also only need one row of the plywood. It will get pretty heavy, so just put one row on and that will keep the entire piece together. 
We called our dad outside to help us get it on top of the trailer and then we tacked it in place, bracing it with the other two by fours we had laying around and making sure that it was plumb. Plumb means that it is straight up and down. So when someone says you wanna make sure that your framing is square and plumb, that means you wanna make sure that your corners are at 90 and that your walls sand straight up. Those two by fours that you see on a diagonal are just holding up the wall until we're able to build and add on the other walls. Once we do that, we will pop them off and corner the walls together. But for now, that's what those are, if you're wondering. My brother is prying off the base plate so that the second row of OSB can reach a full 90 degrees in the corner, and that's what I'm tacking in place. If you're doing this while it's standing up, it's definitely a two-person job. The first wall is set in place and all of the OSB is on, so now we're moving to the second wall. I'm laying out the top and bottom plates at 16 inches on center. Remember, this is extremely important in framing anything. Doing this before I cut the studs and then I'm going to put it all together on the ground, add the plywood and then hike it up on the trailer for round two. Definitely learn from the first wall. This time around, we're going to be doing it into two smaller parts hiking it up on the trailer and then connecting it into one wall. The other one was so hard and as the old saying goes, you wanna work smarter, not harder, save your back. So I'm framing up one of the portions and my brother is adding the plywood to the other. So as long as you have patience and double check your measurements, you don't need to be a professional framer to get something like this accomplished. You just need to remember 16 inches on center, square your corners and plumb your walls. My brother is on another job site today, so it's just my older daughter and I finishing up that framing. I called my brother for help because I actually call him for every single carpentry question that I have. And I knew that if he was there and got the ball rolling that I would feel the confidence to finish. I know I have the skill, but it's also a really large job solo and it's pretty intimidating. I did go to school for carpentry, but when I graduated, I took the renovations route. So essentially, yes, I have framed before and I know how to frame, but it's not what I do day to day. But it's also a really cool way to show everybody who's watching that even if you don't do that as a career, you're able to, you just need to practice patience while you're doing it and you will be fine. We got the back wall and the remainder of the second wall up and secured. Malia has been around power tools since she was small. I believe in teaching them the proper way and teaching them safety versus telling them, no, they can't do it. And it has definitely paid off. She's nine years old. She grabs the drill and she knows exactly what to do and how to be safe about it. It's a life skill. So no matter what career she chooses later in life, she will understand the basics of power tools. Once all of your walls are framed, you can start to add your OSB or your plywood. You're gonna screw it into the studs every four to six inches. Typically, you do nail off your sheathing. Sheathing is also just another word for OSB and plywood. But I suggest you use screws in the tiny home because everything on the frame is going to be a little bit stronger with the screws versus nails. This thing is hitting the highway and all of the bumps along the way. I just felt safer screwing it in. Getting your sheathing on is really rewarding because you can finally start to see your build take shape. Last thing to frame is the bump out section. I didn't want the tiny home to be this big metal rectangle or look like I was hauling around a shipping container. So I wanted some sort of depth and I was going to build out onto the trailer neck. This varies on the build and the design you're doing as well as the trailer that you've chosen to build on. If it doesn't apply to you, maybe you'll learn something for your future build. I used pressure treated for the bottom and I had to build the walls up a little bit, but essentially they are framed the exact same way, just with a thicker bottom plate. Two sections of three feet, and then the front flat wall is two feet across. And then I'm going to continue the box on top, which will be another bunk. The bunk on top is very basic. It's just 36 inches wide and 36 inches tall. I will sheath it and attach it. And now my tiny home will have just a bit more depth to the exterior. It's also great because this acts as another sleeping area. I'm going to get a custom piece of foam cut, and then the kids are going to have their own little sleeping loft. It's 
really, really cold. Um, yes, there's a major temperature change because I had about a three or four month break on the tiny home. I have some other projects going on that I will talk to you about a little later on. But for now, I have to talk to you about the roof while I'm inside of it because I actually lost the footage of myself doing it. I have the idea of doing a flat roof and then a lean-to, but I just ended up putting a basic pitch roof on. I think it's classic, it looks really pretty, and it's gonna go with the sort of more rustic theme that I'm gonna put on the inside of this. It's not even gonna be rustic, it's going to be like a refined cabin. But anyway, I want a wood ceiling and then I'm actually gonna turn the two by fours here. You can see they're going across the collar ties and I'm going to wrap them in pine and then stain them so that way they look as if there's faux beams. There's only two of them in there right now. I'll probably add in two more. They won't be structural, but yeah, let's get into the roof build. The roof that I built has a 112 pitch, which is barely a slope at all. And it translates to every 12 inches that it runs across, it will rise up one inch. So in the center, there's only a few inches raised from the outer walls, just enough to look like a pitch, but low enough not to cause an issue when I'm driving under overpasses. It also translates to a five degree angle. So my two by fours were cut on five degrees on both ends and attached to the ridge board and the top plate of the outer walls. I added pressure treated plywood because at this point in the pandemic, it was actually cheaper than the OSB. Everything is attached together with GRK bolts, not regular wood screws. They are much stronger. And I'm going to be adding roofing hangers as well in the next episode. Roofing alone, 10 out of 10, I do not recommend it, but it was small and I got it done. The last thing before installing the metal is getting the blue skin and the Tyvek on. The reason I chose blue skin for the front was I was concerned about the driving rain on the highway and it getting up and under the metal. So the front half and the roof are done in blue skin and the back is done with Tyvek. Start from the bottom up when you do blue skin, always use the primer and have all of your joints overlap by at least four to six inches. The footage is bad quality here because these are the few clips that I was able to pull off of my Instagram stories. Uh, I lost so much footage, but I have learned the lesson to back up my laptop and my phone. And just like that, phase one of building the frame is complete. A buddy of mine is installing the metal roofing and siding that I got from Scotia Metal, so I'm going to haul it over to his house and bring it back when it's pretty. I originally wanted black on black siding, but the more I read up on it, the more I figured it would act as a heat trap in the summertime, so I went with white and copper accents, and I plan to paint a really cool mural on the side of it. So I have since learned the big lesson of backing up my phone and my laptop so I won't lose any of the footage going forward for the next three phases. If they are done, I'm going to link them here. If not, that means I'm still currently working on them. Phase two is going to be insulating everything as well as heating and the plumbing. So I'm going to be doing the subfloor and I'm going to be doing the walls and the roof. But before that, I have to run the electrical. We're going to talk about the adapters, the converters, whether I use propane, solar, plug-in, and then I'm also going to be dealing with the three S's with it, which is shit, shower, and sink. So we're gonna figure out where they're going and where the gray water is going and where the fresh water is going. That way this entire camper can be a complete off-grid home. So you're gonna wanna stay tuned for that one.